Hi, everyone. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Ned Ned Nerb, the Schizophrenic. Today, I'm with Michelle Saika. Did I pronounce that correctly? It's actually CISA. CISA. Okay. It's not phonetic at all. Everyone guesses Saika. Okay. Well, today, it's a great, a great thing. I'm going to do an interview with Michelle CISA. And uh, um, she's going to ask some questions. Uh, because I've been participating in this campaign, Bust a Myth BC, with the BC Schizophrenia Society. Michelle Sisa is with the BC Schizophrenia Society, working with them on this campaign. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the BCSS and uh, the campaign, Michelle? Sure. So the BC Schizophrenia Society is a nonprofit for British Columbia. Uh, it's 38 years old this year. And the, um, the mission of the organization is to support friends and family and people living with schizophrenia. Um, so to advocate for better services and a, a better understanding of mental illness. Um, and the Bust a Myth contest was launched on World Schizophrenia Day, which is May 24th. And the purpose of the campaign is to challenge some common myths about schizophrenia, which is a pretty misunderstood mental illness. Um, I'm new to working with the BC Schizophrenia Society. I'm just working with them for a short time on this campaign. And one thing I didn't know before I started working with them is that schizophrenia is quite common. It's more common yeah. than diabetes or yeah. MS. Um, it's, I think the, the estimated- Everybody, instance, Everybody's heard of those too, right? Everybody's yeah. heard of those and knows something about them, right? Well, and if one in a hundred people has schizophrenia, then probably everyone knows someone with schizophrenia. So there should be more discussion and more awareness of what that really looks like, as opposed to, I think a lot of people's impressions are just what they see in movies or TV, um, totally. which is pretty skewed. So it's been really interesting working on it and learning from people who have schizophrenia, people who have family members with schizophrenia. And I'm excited to talk to you and hear about your experience because we've really been loving your videos and I found cool. them very educational. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So um, might as well start with the questions. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, your, your channel viewers are probably more familiar with your work than me, but maybe you could start by telling me a little bit about yourself and how you started this YouTube channel. All right. Uh, my mind can move fast. <laughs> So a little bit about myself could easily turn into a lot of random ideas, right? <laughs> so I'll tell you about my handle, Ned Ned mm -hmm. Nerb. So it's pretty simple. If you say my first name with an extra syllable, it's Brenden Den. Mm -hmm. Backwards, that's Ned Ned Nerb. I guess I feel mixed up and turned around. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first email address. And uh, when I made my YouTube channel, in two th when I first made it, that's what I called it. So that's just what I did. But anyway, um, here's a little about me. <laughs> and this is some like biographical details that I haven't really shared on my channel before because I usually just stick to a topic and go with it. So I was born on Vancouver Island in a small town. I received the Governor General's Bronze Medal for my grade 12 performance. It was a performance. I didn't attend the last quarter of my classes. This was 2002 when I had spent the year obsessed about the planes in New York on September 11th, 2001. That was a rough day which caused a lot of the symptom called preoccupation. By fall 2002, when my application had already been accepted at UBC in Vancouver, I hadn't registered for any courses and was in a psych ward in Comox General. I received a diagnosis of undifferentiated schizophrenia, life changes forever. Well, I started Vancouver Island University in fall 2003. Summer 2005, I went home to my small town and started making electronic music, which evolved into a career today as an audio engineer. But summer of 2006, I made my first videos on YouTube, the very first titled The Birdcage for Spirit which is the name of a poem I wrote. Sadly, days after my fourth video, I relapsed on a substance I used to abuse and was back in the psych ward for my second hospitalization. And uh, yeah, so I started making videos. Uh, and anyway, 
that's what I, that's a little bit about myself and I could go on, but I'll just keep it like that. So what about your next question? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess my next question was, why did you decide to start making videos about schizophrenia? From the start, my videos expressed my perspective and my experience of schizophrenia. And I also enjoyed my audio and digital experiments. The first two videos were trying to share and awaken a view of my mental states and experiences. I was exploring myself and trying to give away knowledge for free. I was always a fan of education and imagined in high school I'd become a teacher. It was natural to adapt my videos more and more to advocating and teaching to raise awareness and to smash and to smash stigma. A hashtag for the Bust the Myth BC campaign which is why I love this BC Schizophrenia Society campaign about dispelling myths around the condition. So it was a natural fit. And uh, yeah. And I've seen that you get a lot of comments and questions on each of your videos about mental health and mental illness. So what's a, one of the most common questions you get? I love the comments I get. Insights, questions, experiences, suggestions. The more the merrier. I think the most common question I've received over the years goes something like this. Hey, I have this experience too. How do you differentiate a symptom of schizophrenia from a weird quirk? So what do you say to that? My response usually is that in fact, more than just being a quirk, the illness, confusion, and suffering are what identify psychosis the most. If a person is otherwise okay and has a lot of these quirks, there is a word for that, schizotypal traits. It's like, so a lot of people, more people than have schizophrenia have traits of schizophrenia. They're just not ill. They're not unwell. They're holding it together. They don't have a diagnosis, but they still might have some of the strange experiences, even hear a voice now and again, like maybe close to sleep and dreaming or something. They'll hear a voice, have an auditory hallucination. That's, that's a schizotypal trait, a schizophrenic symptom, but it's not a symptom of schizophrenia unless you're unwell. And that's like the key. It's a, that's why they say mental illness. It's like whatever other traits we have, being ill and being unwell is like really the significant thing. Mm -hmm. If you're not unwell, there's nothing to treat, right? Yeah. Just so lots of people have schizotypal traits but aren't ill right. in any way. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. That's a good myth to bust. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as we talked about, we're running this contest um, to try and dispel myths and stereotypes about schizophrenia that can be harmful. And uh, you've obviously tackled quite a few, so you're familiar with lots of them. Why do you think they're so persistent and how else can we work to change those common misperceptions? I'm glad you sent me the questions in advance because I <laughs> thought about this one and I like my answer. <laughs> so, I'm excited to hear it. Repetition is a tricky thing. Like learning a word in one situation, you say it again in the same situation later. The trouble is when the situation is actually unique as well as the word being a lie. So that's what a stereotype or myth is. As a wild speculation, I think about language and memory, perhaps the way normal brains are wired to renew culture. This works as a way to survive the generations and thus to adapt slowly and maintain advantages. A psychotic person is obviously violating that norm. And education and shifting old perspectives are part of the way to dispel myths and stereotypes. I think it's a complex answer, and it could go a lot. I could talk a lot more about that, but that that's that's what I think. That's what I thought about that question. That's <laughs> so a great I, answer. When we like a lot of the stigma and myths and stereotypes are just repetitions of the brain. We're repeating. Oh, that mm -hmm. person looks like that, so they must feel that way. They must have that situation. And that's just a repetition. It's like, it's redundant. It's the same thing going on in the brain, like prejudice, other kinds of uh, myth and stereotype that are just like the same thing being repeated again, a racist stereotype, a sexist stereotype, any of things like that, or something about mental illness. It's just like, this is what I see and I'm repeating it. And yeah. Like, it's basically just that. It's not so like, it's not, it's not a profound thought whenever somebody says something sexist or racist. It's just the, 
the same old again, right? <laughs> Everyone yeah. who recognizes it knows that it's just that again. <laughs> so we need new stories and new kind yeah. of facts to repeat to ourselves to yeah. drown those out. To keep listening to people, the voices that are speaking out, right? <laughs> and yeah. Listening and sharing and click Which share. Which is why your channel's so great. Because you're, <laughs> you're sharing your experience. And I imagine for a lot of people, that's now what they think about when they think about schizophrenia and schizotypal traits instead of these yeah. old myths right. that you've been recycling. Yeah, totally. So the BC Schizophrenia Society, a lot of what they do is supporting friends and family members to help them help their loved ones who have schizophrenia. Um, so for someone who has a friend or a family member who's been recently diagnosed, what advice would you give for how they can support that person? I came up with a general answer and a specific answer because I thought that those were both good. Yeah, let's hear them. <laughs> so learn more about symptoms. Learn more about the wide range of outcomes. One of the myths is that having schizophrenia is a one-way dead end. Actually, a lot can vary. Some people have the same symptoms for a long period. Personally, I've had different experiences over my four major hospitalizations. Give space for people to stabilize and adapt. We can hopefully be resilient. And as a piece of concrete advice, do not argue with a person defending delusional thinking. It just aggravates the emotion and in my experience, reinforces the delusion. It's just mm -hmm. practice for the symptom that you enable by arguing. Mm -hmm. And uh, delusions are usually defined as false belief held to the contrary of any reasonable evidence. You simply cannot tell a schizophrenic the truth and tell them to believe it because it makes sense to you. Don't try. Focus on helping them relax and explore their situation in other ways. Listen, but don't fight back. <laughs> that's really useful advice I think yeah it's like um I now there's contention in the community and psychiatry field about whether mental illness is just a brain disease and like that's a that's a contentious issue there's like obviously we have minds so it's a mental disease but we have brains so our mind is in our brains somehow but the way that some older doctors might explain this delusion thing is that they'd say the brain is doing the delusion. It's a rut. It's a stuck. It's a bad habit. And mm -hmm. that the brain is just persisting and rotating the delusional thought. And that's why you can't argue against it. You can't like argue against a thing sitting there. Don't sit there. It'll still sit there. So the brain mm -hmm. is like still doing its thing sometimes. And like, yeah. yeah. So in my experience, you can't argue with it. I've, I've seen family members of people I know have schizophrenia and the family members will argue with them, especially at the beginning. And like, it doesn't work. The person ends up yelling and screaming and like, yeah. it, it doesn't work to just to talk away powerful delusions that are in the brain mind or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That seems like such a, such a common impulse. You want to say like snap out of it. And if you, you think right. if you can say something yeah. that, that they'll see is true, maybe you can change how they're thinking. But yeah. and there's, and that doesn't work with anybody, end. even right. people who don't have right. schizophrenia. If they believe right. something, you can't really talk someone out of their beliefs. Not, not just talk out of it. You, can't, you have to like go slowly to slowly mm -hmm. work on that convincing an argument, right? You can't, yeah. you can't just yell it in a heated argument. No, we're never going to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, yeah. I like that you said that a lot of people think that schizophrenia is a dead end and that's not true because that's another thing that that I've heard from so many people during this this campaign is that you know there's lots of treatment options there's lots of like ways that people can live fulfilling and you know yeah. pretty pretty great lives and I think that it's that's different for everyone some people yeah. have a really hard time for a long time and maybe yeah. something could be done to help them better in another in another situation but yeah. Lots of people do get better. They get different they, the changes and yeah. Yeah. And people shouldn't, shouldn't take that kind of gloomy doomed view of it. Yeah. And that's why I said at the end of their focus on helping them relax and explore their situation in other ways. Listen, yeah. but don't fight back. Mm -hmm. I've found I can watch my friend, my friend with schizophrenia and, and their family member. I can watch them arguing 
I can watch the heated energy in the person with schizophrenia. They're getting incensed over the issues. And then the person, the family member will walk away and I'll chat with them for two minutes and they'll be calming down just yeah. because I know not to talk about the delusion. I talk about other stuff. I say, Hey, how are you feeling? What's going on? How are you feeling is different than what are you thinking about that object or that situation? So it's like, it, it just changes the action of the brain and like gets out of that repetition I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. Just kind of change the track for the thinking. Right. Yeah. Talk about something else. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And you mentioned, you know, that for different people, there are different things that could help them better, which kind of leads to my next question. How do you think the BC health system could better support people with schizophrenia? Well, in uh, my interest in education, I thought about school. (laughs) Yeah. And I wrote this. My mom has said for years that required courses in high school ought to include home economics and personal and family finances. More than history, more than just math, it should be finances, how to run a home. But, and I would add to that mental health education, sex education, studies of historical and common contemporary abuses. I think everything would get better. History would not go forgotten. Friends would not go unhelped. Family would always be supported by community and individuals could work together. Just education, bringing up the society differently. In like a few generations, our society has gone from like, our society has gone from more overt, intense violence and racism to more conscious, like the whole society is more conscious of it than it was in the past. Mm -hmm. And like things are upset and things are like not perfect in the, in the world, but it could get better and better and better. Some people think it'll never get better and we shouldn't try. We shouldn't do anything. We should just ride along and do our own thing. But I think we should all work together and help everyone who's needs supported. Right. And like some people just forget about like our social welfare systems. People are just forgotten and Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're not supported the whole life. They're not, their future relapses are not prevented. They're just given a, placebo basically for like time (laughs) yeah right well and I think yeah I think starting in school is such a great idea because it's it's about kind of teaching that empathy and and understanding other people's experiences historically and today that that lets people grow up with that broader understanding of how other people live as opposed to you know avoiding uncomfortable topics whether it's sex education or mental illness it just makes people think that there's something shameful or a secret about that that they can't talk about Um, those two topics it might be better now I haven't been in high school for a long time (laughs) since 2002 (laughs) but for me in high school in 2002 early 2000s it was like um uh the sex education and mental health education were kind of like a a little seminar Mm -hmm. once a year. And we did a two days of watching some videos about body parts and stuff like that. (laughs) Yeah. Like for how important and common sex and mental health are. Yeah. We're not taught more about that. We get required courses that all the kids think are a waste of time. Like, that's an, uh, an education system right for change and passion. When kids yeah. are interested in things and could be shown what they're interested in, like, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'd spend some of that time we spent making baking soda and vinegar volcanoes on mental health. That was fun, too. That was fun. But <laughs> yeah. I don't want to cut that. I'm sure there was no. something else. <laughs> Maybe science is useful too. Science is good because there's so much science in technology and medicine that if you don't know the science or the technology, you will miss out yeah. like on, on things in this world. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of that too, is having the right people teach because I remember in high school, whichever teacher was sort of your, your gym teacher, or your health teacher had to talk about sex education and they weren't comfortable with it often. So they would be embarrassed yeah. and then everyone would be embarrassed. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> The same is probably true for mental health and mental illness. You know, people bring their own experiences with that and they might not be comfortable or capable of, of providing education in it. So maybe bringing in people who have lived experience who are more comfortable talking to kids and answering questions. 
Yeah. That would be good. The, the school does bring in elders and other people sometimes to do discussions and yeah. cultural workshops and stuff. And psychiatric or psychological workshops are very important because so many, so many people are going to experience mental health issues in their life to not be oh, taught yeah. about it is not the best preparation. That's true. I, I'll, I'll, a little bit uh, more about myself. In 2000, 2000, in grade 10 or grade 11, I was on the early days of the World Wide Web. And I was on the internet, on the computer, at w- like Windows 95 or something or something like that. And I was um, looking at the internet and I was reading forums and stuff, the early forums and early blogs that existed. And I found some topics like, oh, schizophrenia. These people have schizophrenia and they're talking about their experience. I hadn't really heard of schizophrenia or I didn't think about it until then. But when I was reading it, I was like, hey, this is me. I'm having these experiences. This is me. I have schizophrenia. Yeah. And then a couple years later, stress and substance abuse and that sort of stuff really caught up to me. And I was in the psych ward getting a diagnosis of schizophrenia. But because I had that insight from day one that this is what I'm experiencing, it's a mental health situation, I didn't have stigma about the situation, I didn't have fear, I didn't have ignorance, and I was accepting the whole time for all these years since 2002, I was accepting of my medication. I wasn't always happy to take my meds, I wasn't always happy about the side effects, but I always took it and I always thought, I do have schizophrenia, it can be treated, it can be, it, you can be okay with schizophrenia, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. I, I had that idea. And like, if other kids had those ideas or some of them before they started getting more intense stress and symptoms, they might all do better. Like I'm, I'm a good example of someone who does well in the world after the hospital. I, I've yeah. uh, like, over the years, I've gone to university, I went to audio school, I've had jobs of various sorts and worked for here and then, especially since 2010, when I went to audio school, and I've just done audio jobs and that sort of stuff since then. Mm -hmm. I haven't done any dishwashing like I did in university summers, (laughs) for instance. And like, so, but yeah, um, some people who don't have the acceptance, don't have the insight, it just runs into problem after problem after problem. And they, they're more frustrated. They don't understand. And like, I accepted schizophrenia was just a fact of life. Yeah. And some people don't want to accept it. They don't want the stigma. They don't want the label. They don't want the pressure from society. And it's a negative, totally negative experience to, to have the condition. Yeah. For me, I've been in a position where I can like, when I'm in the hospital, I'm stressed out. I'm having trouble. I'm bouncing off the walls. They're sometimes tying me down, et cetera, right? Like it's, it's a scary situation when you're totally psychotic. But then out of the hospital, I've managed to be okay for the most part. I still have symptoms almost every day, right? But uh, mm-hmm. it's like I take my meds every day. I take them on time. And I, you know, keep focusing on all that kind of stuff. And, yeah, yeah. it and works. Hopefully- you know, other people who are experiencing symptoms or, or just learning about schizophrenia will find your videos and they'll, they'll learn from that and they won't have this yeah. or fear associated with it. Exactly. So that's what I'm doing, right? I'm, that's yeah. what I saw in 2000 or whatever. It's like, oh, the word schizophrenia, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> like having that. And that's like when, when people comment on my videos and say, hey, I have this experience. They might be learning about it for the first time or like, yeah. and now, yeah, even in, even in like 2008 or 2009, the comments I got were not as focused and aware, self-aware. There's more mm-hmm. self-awareness in the comments I get now. Like people yeah. are more aware of the condition of the terminology used. And I'm, I'm glad that they still appreciate my videos, but yeah, it's, it's great that they, that more people know more in yeah. general. And that's, a and that's great what we thing. want. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the more people know, the less of that stigma and fear there will be. Totally. Yeah. Well, thanks, Brendan. That was all my yeah. questions. Great. I think that's a good interview. All right. Well, thanks so much.
So I'm gonna, I don't think there's much to edit, just maybe cut the ends. I, I, yeah. I think I like that. I'll do some sound editing to make it nice and clear and crisp. And, Great. <laughs> and yeah, I'll uh, send you the video before I upload it and then everyone will see it. So yeah. thanks everyone for watching. Thanks for tuning in to Ned Ned Nerd the Schizophrenic with Michelle Sika over there. And uh, um, thank you, Michelle. And thank you, BC Schizophrenia Society. Thank you for reaching out. It's really cool to be asked to do an interview from an organization that I've known about for years. And uh, it's really great. Thank you so much thank for you. all of your work. It's been so great to watch your videos and I look forward to seeing what you put out next. All right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>